Hello and welcome to this episode of Fort Worth Forward. I'm Michael Crane and I'm coming to you from the UNT Health Science Center Next Headquarters. I'm excited today to have Trey Bowles, the new Managing Director of Techstars, Fort Worth Police Chief Neil Noakes, and American icon Opal Lee with me today. Let's get started. Well, thank you for joining us today. I'm here now with Trey Bowles, who's the Managing Director of Techstars. Welcome, Trey. Thank you for having me. It's good to be here. You're welcome. No, so tell us a little bit about your background. What is Techstars? So my background, I'm an entrepreneur. I've been an entrepreneur since I was in college and um, have built companies in a bunch of different fields, primarily tech, media, entertainment um, related stuff, and, and done a little bit of work in healthcare, and then spent the last 10, ten years of my career building entrepreneurial support mechanisms for entrepreneurs to help people start building, grow a business. And I've done that primarily in North Texas. And uh, so uh, I, I decided that a lot of the work that I've been doing is based around this concept of events and programs and pulling together things that facilitate entrepreneurship. But with Techstars, I now get to be on the investment side and providing capital for companies that we think are really exciting and, and could grow quickly. So Techstars is a global investment company yeah. and their mission is to help um, everyone in the world play a role in benefiting or contri contributing to uh, startups and entrepreneurs and so we are developing a accelerator for Fort Worth called Techstars Physical Health Fort Worth. Okay. What's and, an accelerator? How, how do people find that? Yeah so there's a lot of different definitions. The way I think the probably the most globally accepted definition is it's typically a program where a company comes in you select them um, you invest money in that program, you invest money in the company, you get a little bit of equity in the company for that. And then the crutch of it all is they go through a 13 week program. And that 13 week program, they're getting access to mentors, they're getting okay. access to cur curriculum, potential investors, really helping them solidify their business model and get to a place where uh, when they leave the program, they'll be able to grow substantially, find great companies or partner relationships, and hopefully raise some cash. Okay. I know this is all. Uh kind of a public-private partnership of sorts, right? The city, we've put some money behind Techstars, the county's put some money behind Techstars and some private investment to get this off and running uh, to, to do that. Absolutely, I think it is such a great show of leadership by these different partners, the city of Fort Worth, Tarrant County, uh, UNT Health Science Center, and John Golf with Golf Capital. Um, it's this kind of thing that you need to do to see entrepreneurship and innovation really flourish in an area. Um, it's about bringing together different stakeholders and having them do what they do best and adding value in the way that they can add value. And it will create an unbelievable opportunity for tech stars, an unbelievable opportunity for Fort Worth and then entrepreneurs from around the world to get to come here and see why this is gonna be the hub for physical health innovation on the planet. Let's talk about that. This accelerator, at least the first one we're putting here in Fort Worth, will focus on physical health. It so, will. So how does that work? And, so what is yeah. physical health? Well, yeah. physical health, I think the way we look at it is it's really any aspect of the health and wellness process that could be mental, that could be physical. When we think about it, we sort of separate this up into different things. The type of companies that we're looking for are companies that are scalable and sustainable. Okay. Right. So not physical therapists that want to launch an office. That's great. And that is 100 percent entrepreneurship, but not what this program focus on. We're focusing on things like hardware and wearables. Okay. We're focused on things like software and platform technologies. How do you leverage uh, AR and VR? How do you utilize artificial intelligence and machine to machine learning? We're gonna look at stuff like performance enhancement, exercise, which can bring you into a world of sports. So not just the idea of how do we uh, diagnose and give care to people who have health issues, but how do we provide preventative health solutions as well? And so we're really lucky to have UNT Health Science Center here with all the resources that they have with clinics and labs and mm -hmm. patients and research and osteopathic medicine. And um, so I'm looking forward to that partnership specifically because I think there's a lot of things that when these companies come here locally to participate in the program, mm -hmm. they'll be able to really, really benefit from that relationship with UNT Health Science Center. That's wonderful. You've talked a little bit about uh, who should apply or who shouldn't apply. What does the ideal kind of candidate look like for y'all as you're working through this? Who, how, who is that and how do they apply to be a part of this? So the way that you apply is you can, you can either go to our website within Techstars or you can go to f6s.com, which is where our application will reside. Okay. And you can apply. It's about 12 to 13 weeks that we're going to allow applications to um, be active. They actually opened 
on February 22nd. So okay. right now you can apply. And we're going to leverage the Techstars network and the uh, the network of the people in Fort Worth to really find companies that are a good fit for that. In my mind, it's not somebody who has just written an idea on the back of the napkin, but somebody who's begun to explore that idea. They don't have to have revenue. They don't have to be already su su succeeding, but they need to be in a place where they kind of have an idea about what they want to do and the market that exists okay. and the customer base and the total addressable market and area that they can go out and do that. We want them to have a vision and a plan for a problem that they can solve okay and then we can bring along subject matter experts and mentors to help come alongside them and help them which will hopefully create a more compelling offering for raising additional capital and growing your customer base oh wow so you'll have the access you said earlier to mentors other people to maybe help package them up to seek that capital uh, and invest. Absolutely. I think the role of mentor is really one that is about removing obstacles that stand in your way, right? We want to find people, subject matter experts, experienced entrepreneurs that have been there and done that before that can help a entrepreneur or founder with the fact that they don't know what they don't know. Right. And so helping them remove those obstacles, allow them to get around hurdles, increases the likelihood that they can launch their business. And then as we begin to think and target companies, not just locally, but across the country that would be good customers for some of these companies. We want to help establish those relationships. And it really is what it is. It's an accelerator. We want to accelerate the amount of time it takes them to start and launch their business, grow their business, and then hopefully eventually exit that business. Has there, are there, give me some success stories. You don't have to actually name companies, but success stories of people that have gone through this process and what they're doing now. In, across this Techstars network. Well, yeah, yeah. I think companies across this te Techstars network have raised almost $20 billion. Wow. I think we have 13 unicorns right now. A unicorn is a company that's worth more than a billion dollars. Mm. And so when you think about companies like that, there's a lot out there that are doing really well. Digital Ocean is one, which is public. SynGrid's another, which is doing really well. There's so many that are just really seeing success. And it's because of the nature of that network. I've worked with Techstars in, in a, um, as colleagues in the past for different projects they have. They don't just do accelerators. They have early stage um, opportunities to support entrepreneurs, people with ideas, startup weekends, startup mm -hmm. weeks. The accelerator is the is the point where I sit now, but I really think it's a benefit and shows a lot of vision on the on the behalf of Cameron Cushman and the UNT Health Science Center team for having really pushed to bring an organization like Techstars locally and to combine that with the great resources you guys have here. I think it's just a recipe for success, not just for the companies and the entrepreneurs, but just for the overall entrepreneurial ecosystem that exists in Fort Worth. Well, I, I agree with you on that. And I, you know, Cameron's a great guy. He's been on the show before, but just having those conversations as I've talked about with our entrepreneurs, how do we keep continuing to foster them and grow them here and, and, and then give them the resources here where they stay uh, and they don't go somewhere else because we've got a great, a great thing here happening in Fort Worth. So I'm glad you're now on board. You're going to help us grow this. And thanks for being on the show today. Thanks for having me. Yeah, you're great. welcome. We'll be right back. It's now my pleasure to have the Fort Worth Police Chief, Neil Noakes, with us. Welcome. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thanks, Chief. I, I appreciate all you do to keep our citizens safe. And I often say that, you know, our uh, number one job as a council and as, as staff, city staff, is to keep our citizens safe. So I appreciate Great. what you and your men and women out there do for us. Thank you so much. And all credit does go to the men and women out there doing the job. For sure. For sure. Well, you re recently briefed us as council on... You know, violent crime and the numbers, and there are some interesting statistics out there about what's happening, happening in Fort Worth um, and across across the board in other cities too. But what is, con there is an uptick in crime. That I think everybody knows that. What is contributing to that uptick in crime? You know, you're right, it, it is, it's a, it's a national trend, unfortunately, we're seeing across the country. But as we said before, for citizens worried about Fort Worth. Mm -hmm. Not that we don't care about the rest of the country, but as you said, not just with our elected officials like you, but with law enforcement, our primary job is to make people safe and make people feel safe. If we don't accomplish those two things, the rest of what we do doesn't matter so much. Right. So obviously when there's a rise in violent crime in Fort Worth, we're concerned. Um, th we've, we've talked with several different uh, agencies across the state, across the country, about what they're seeing. Uh, we've uh, gone to criminological articles, you know, peer-reviewed journals, and this is something that criminologists will study for years and years and years to find out exactly what contributed, but here's what we hear most frequently. Uh, we hear that the, the pandemic, the fear that it caused with a lot of people, the isolation that it caused. We're, we're social creatures. We're not meant to be isolated. That contributed. 
the economic downturn, the loss of jobs for some people, uh, the way a lot of people just had the stress and anxiety from it, uh, social unrest we saw that was causing maybe some anger. Um, there's a lot of people talk about the proliferation of guns, and I, I'm not an anti-Second Amendment guy, but the problem is guns in the hands of the wrong people Criminal. that we're seeing out there. All these things are kind of converging at the same time, and all of these, it's not, I don't think any one thing, it's, it's, it's several things. One of the things that's most concerning for me, and it's something that's new to this generation, is social media. Mm -hmm. We see oftentimes it starts out as, as a beef on social media, mm -hmm. ends up with blood spilled in the streets. Really? Uh, we we'll have young people who will have arguments online, calling one another out. The next thing you know, there's a shooting behind this argument that started online. Mm. So a lot of these things are new territory for us as law enforcement, but we're all working together, finding the best ways that we can deal with it. it sounds like there's an education piece there yes. with that, of, of having them understand that there's a, a lot of things going on. Just you, you feel safe behind social media. You can just sort of yell exactly. and poke, uh, but then it becomes a real world situation. It sounds like it does. Unfortunately, it does. Wow. Well, I do uh, just want to point this out and that it looks like in 2021 in, in Fort Worth, we had about 388 shootings. 94 of those were fatal. 294 were um, in, resulted in injury, and that's up about 15% from 2020. So we, we are tracking with what you see nationally, too. Yes, absolutely. And in, in addition to that, uh, 2021, we had 118 homicides. Mm. 2020, we had 112. 2019, we only had 71. Mm. So that shows the, the drastic increase. And what criminologists are saying now is that increase we saw from 2019 to 2020, uh, CDC specifically said that's the highest increase they've ever seen year over year, ever since they've been tracking this. Wow. So this, this is definitely something that's going on across the nation. Uh, the numbers we're seeing here in Fort Worth, they concern us yeah. because we don't ever want to see those numbers go up, but especially that drastically. Uh, year to date, we're tracking about even with last year with a lot of our violent crime. But even tracking even flat is not what we want. We want that line to be going down. Sure. And, uh, and so you have this new Fort Worth safe is what you're calling it. Um, and I think it was implemented in May and we have yes. some statistics from May to September. Tell us what that is and how it's a, a new way to address violent crime here in Fort Worth. Traditionally in law enforcement, the way uh, we would deal with an area that was experiencing violent crime is what we call a saturation detail or a zero tolerance detail, where you send as many officers as you can to that area so you're visible. You pull over everything you can for traffic violations, and if there's violations, you write tickets. If you have any on-view arrestable offenses, you arrest people for the, those offenses. The problem is we found out when we were going to neighbors to help, mm -hmm. oftentimes the most impact we were having was a negative impact on the good people that lived there mm -hmm. that wanted the problem out too. Mm -hmm. But it was kind of a, a broad approach. We cast a broad debt and just hope we pull in some of the criminals. And it was done with the best of intentions, but we see over and over and over again over the years, it's resulted in, in a diminished trust between the community and the police, and it's broken down the relationships we've had. Uh, one of the best quotes I've ever heard about that is, if you're taking a zero tolerance approach when you go into a neighborhood, it's like the only tool you have on your tool belt is a hammer. Mm -hmm. And if the only tool you have on your tool belt is a hammer, everybody starts to look like a nail. Mm -hmm. We don't want to do that. We are not doing that. What we're taking is a much more strategic, uh, data-driven, intelligence-led approach where we don't only look at a neighborhood and say, okay, there's violent crime hotspot here. Everybody here must be bad. That is so, that's so wrong. Mm -hmm. It's usually a fraction of a percent of the people in that neighborhood causing the problem. That's right. That's who we go after. We don't and those people want to feel safe, as you said. Exactly. They want a safe neighborhood to live in. The 99% of the good people right. that are living there, they want to be safe too, and they want that 1% or even less than 1% sometimes removed. So we're using a lot of intelligence, working with our crime analysts. Uh, we have a lot of uh, technological advances now where we can actually see crimes in progress. We're going after people that we know are going to be a problem in the neighborhood, people who are carrying guns that shouldn't be, people who are selling drugs, people who have aggravated assault warrants, uh, people who are driving stolen vehicles. That's what we're focusing on right now. And, and something else to do with Fort Worth Safe that I thought was a step in the right direction is we were passing out a lot of cards with Fort Worth Safe with a QR code on the back mm -hmm. that would take uh, citizens to the website. Uh, we had a lot of uh, social media presence about what we were doing, but people could use that QR code. They could go to the website. It would tell you what we're doing, where we're doing it, why we're in the neighborhoods we're in, it'll tell you what our results have been, but it's something else. It asks for feedback. Mm. We have to be working with communities to really do the job right, but if we don't listen to what they have to say, 
it's not really going to do any good and it eventually will stop talking. So we provided an avenue for the, the citizens to actually say, hey, great job over here. That's the house you need to hit. Or there's a problem over here on this block. Would you please give this some attention? And it let us know what we were doing right, what we were doing wrong. And it was a way to have a two-way communication. A transparent with conversation with our citizens. Very transparent. Yeah. Yes, sir. That's, that's, that's amazing. Uh, do you have any success stories? with Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, you know, one of, the, one of the biggest success stories, I think, is we were actually talking with one of the communities that was hardest hit by violent crime. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, it's one of the ones that also is, we've had a, a lack of trust with PD that we're working on. We talked about the initiative. We talked about what we were going to do. And they seem concerned mm -hmm. because I think in their mind, they're thinking, oh, this is like we remember way back when. Mm -hmm. and I said, well, have you noticed anything different? Have you been inconvenienced recently or have you had problems with the police? No, but worried about what's going to happen when you start. I said, we started a month ago. Mm -hmm. They didn't even know. Yeah. The fact that we were in there, we'd remove violent criminals, guns, drugs, stolen vehicles out of their neighborhood. Didn't even realize anything was going on that was different. Right. It wasn't negatively impacting those communities. But some of the, I talked about the technological advances. Mm -hmm. Cameras have been a, a, just a game changer for us. Mm -hmm. They're a false, force multiplier for us. There have been situations where we've been able to not only develop a suspect, but make an arrest in a homicide only because of those cameras. Not to say we maybe wouldn't have been able to find that information out days, weeks, or months down the road through just some hard detective work. But I'm talking about in less than an hour, we came up with a license plate. Okay. We were able to locate that vehicle. We were able to get a suspect out of it. Once we are even able to track back through the system and see where, uh, unfortunately, a body had been dumped mm -hmm. after a homicide. Without these cameras, without this technology, there's no way we could have done that otherwise. Well, and you know, there is some, some, some naysayers that say it's invasion of privacy and other things that they use to... But I think what you see are the results on the other side when the cameras work and we're able to solve com crimes quickly or sometimes prevent crimes as they're in, in pro progress. Absolutely. Yeah. And I understand concern from citizens. The last thing they want is Big Brother right. watching over them or spying on them or uh, focusing on areas of town where we're discriminating in the way we're using those cameras. I can assure you we're not here to watch uh, the good citizens of Fort Worth. We're looking in areas where we're seeing crimes, maybe at in convenience stores, areas where we're, we're known that we know there are drug dealing activities going on. We're going to areas where we need to address the violent actors in the neighborhoods. We're not going after the good citizens of Fort Worth. I've heard you say, um, you've said it, the mayor said it, you know, you can be pro-community and pro-police at the same time. I believe in it. So how do we get the community involved in this? What are some of the programs that are outreach to the community? The the standard, I think, in law enforcement for many years was we expected the community to come to us. Mm -hmm. They know where you are. They, they can come to us. Mm -hmm. I'm sure they will, right? No, that's not the way it works. There's some people in our community that don't feel safe. Absolutely. To come to so, yes. As I mentioned in uh, the presentation at council last week, sometimes the people who need, need us the most mm -hmm. are the ones that trust us the least. Right. So it's up to us in law enforcement to take that first step. Mm -hmm. It's up to us to be very intentional about creating opportunities for positive engagement that are completely outside of law enforcement. Uh, we've had a lot of programs, one called Beyond the Badge, mm -hmm. where we meet with community members in Fort Worth. And with this one, we're specifically looking sometimes for community members who maybe have had bad interactions with the police. Uh, we, we can't always go only to the communities and citizens who tell us we're awesome. <laughs> we have to be willing to have hard conversations and go to communities that say, you know what, I don't like what you're doing, here's why. And we're having those hard conversations. I had an event earlier today about a program called Shop Talk, okay. which we just brought to Fort Worth, where we're going in barbershops and salons and a lot of the socioeconomically disadvantaged, underserved areas where, where we don't have those great relationships. And we're having hard conversations, very intentional about going out. Uh, and we that, have, from what I understand, I mean, from my communities that I represent, that's where a lot of business gets done, in the barbershops and beauty shops. If right? you really want to know what's yeah. going on, go, yep. to, go to a barbershop. Yeah, right. That's but. Thing is, we have to go continuously. It can't just be a show up one time right. and be gone. Right. We're not going to hear anything. Right. But once we're there and we develop relationships, we can have open conversations about things. That's great. Uh, a lot of youth engagement programs, like our Police Athletic League, mm -hmm. Operation Progress, which is in your district. Mm -hmm. uh, we've got a lot of uh, programs now where we're investing in students mm -hmm. who may be interested in law enforcement. So we're trying to make sure we encourage them, provide some scholarship opportunities, provide mentoring and coaching. There are a lot of programs where we're being very intentional about meeting people where they are figuratively and literally and being the ones that take the first step to engage with the community. Well, all that is, is great. I will say I'm a big proponent of the neighborhood police officers, yes. our MPOs. They're my, normally my first call when I want to know something that's going on in the neighborhood. 
Um, and so how do they fit into this, this process, process too? Neighborhood police officers or NPOs are, are rock stars. Mm -hmm. I always knew they did a lot of work, but it was when I, was, <laughs> I became a commander right. in North Division. And I really worked closely with that team we had up there of NPOs. It's phenomenal what mm -hmm. they do. Uh, jacks of all trades in a lot of ways, but it seemed, they seem to be master of all at the same time. Right. Uh, they are community policing experts, and really for community policing to work, it's got to permeate the entire agency, and yeah. we get that, and that's what we're preaching at Forward PD. But people who can go into a community, deal with maybe a long-term uh, quality of life issue, not some specific crime that has to be dealt with as, as an emergency right now, mm -hmm. although they do that too, right. but they dive into the problem. They, they create relationships with citizens, with business owners, with faith leaders, with uh, grassroots organizations in their small beat mm -hmm. to try to make those connections and build those real lasting right. genuine relationships. And if not for the work of our MPOs since Chief Wyndham brought them so many years ago, I don't think we would have the relationships we have right now. We wouldn't have as many programs as we have right now. We wouldn't have the community support that we enjoy so much right now. Well, it, get, it gets to that point, I've heard you say many times, we're not going to arrest our way out of crime. True. So those are some of those frontline programs that help us, um, and the other programs that you mentioned too, have helped us to, to that's not our, our sole f focus, is just to arrest everybody. Absolutely. Right? It's, there is, arresting is part of it. That's right. One thing I don't right. ever want people to think of saying, well, we'll never arrest anyone. We have people out there killing each other. Yes. We have innocent people being caught in the crossfire of these beefs. We absolutely will arrest people but we're going for the violent actors who are out there causing the aggravated assaults, the murders, the robberies. That's our primary focus right now. But we also know if we can prepare and empower a community, then we're ahead of the game. Uh, a gentleman named Noble Crawford, who's with mm -hmm. Hope Farm, right. used to always say it's- Noble, he's a great guy. Great guy. Great guy. He said it's easier to prepare a boy than repair a That's boy. Right. So we're trying to prepare the best we can. Doesn't mean we're gonna go in the community and tell them what they need. Mm -hmm. We go to the community and ask them what they need. And then we do our best to work with a lot of different organizations, uh, nonprofits, whoever we can to provide those resources to the community. So speaking of that, how does the community get involved in this? How can they help with your reduction in violent crime? The saying that we hear over and over again, if you see something, say something. Okay. That applies here. If you see something, say something, please reach out. We've got obviously 911. Mm -hmm. We have got our non-emergency number, 817-392-4222. Right. We have the My Fort Worth app. We have our Crime Stoppers number, which is 817-469-8477. Uh, yeah, on our website, you can scroll down to uh, one band and it says one address. Mm -hmm. Start typing in your home address. It will auto-populate. Click on it. It'll tell you your commander for your area. It will tell you your MPO for your area, your crime prevention specialist. It will tell you your council member. Tell you who, yeah. Exactly. Tell you permits, permits around you. What's been a lot of information on that. Tons one address. Fort Worth, Texas. Gov. I think. Great is. resource. Yeah. Absolutely great resource. Uh, you can also go on our Fort Worth Safe. Just type in Fort Worth Safe mm -hmm. or hashtag Fort Worth Safe. Okay. It will take you to the site. A lot of information on what we're doing. Uh, we're refining things right now because one thing we're, we we know is we can't have one plan and just leave it in place. Right. The dynamics change, and we're one thing about Fort Worth Safe. It's agile. We can change as we need to based on the trends we're seeing. We've got citizen groups too, citizen on patrol, citizen police officers. So yes, if you really want to get involved, right. if you really want to be part of the solution, we have our Code Blue program, mm -hmm. our citizens on patrol program, our CERT, which is citizens responding to emergency right. situations. Uh, we have our uh, Citizens Police Academy mm -hmm. coming up next month, which is a great way to come in, see what we do, see why we do it, ask questions, maybe you don't understand the process or the procedure, we'll explain it to you. But there are ways you can either provide information with the things we mentioned earlier, or if you want to get out there and get your, you get your feet on the ground, get, your hands streets, dirty. get <laughs> dirty, we got programs for you to do that too. And a lot of people don't realize how, how many people are part of those part programs. Of Ordinary citizens that are just Exactly. Yep. You don't need special training. You don't have to have any kind of special education. We just want people who have a heart for the community and want to help Fort Worth. That's wonderful. Thank you for being here today. Thank you for being on the show. Appreciate, what, again, what you and all your men and women out there do for us and keeping us safe. And thank you for your support uh, Fort Worth PD, as always. Oh, thank you. We'll be right back. Well, now I'm honored to have on Fort Worth Ford a, an American icon named Opal Lee. She's here from Fort Worth and lives in Fort Worth and has lived in Fort Worth for a long period of time. So 
thank you so much for joining us today. Well, thank you for having me. So we, look, you're an icon, and uh, I'll say that your title really should be American Icon. <laughs> Let me tell you what it really is. A little old lady in tennis shoes getting in everybody else's business <laughs> and having a good time doing it. Sometimes you got to do that, right? <laughs> I'm, I, I am happy, and I know many, many other people are, are glad that you put on your tennis shoes <laughs> and, and got in other people's business and, oh, I and did, did this. Oh, I did, I did, I did. Let's talk a little it. bit about your history. You moved here to Fort Worth when you were how old? I was about nine, I think. Yeah, yeah. and mm -hmm. I know you tell a story about what happened when you moved here in your, your house? Oh, we were here. We moved in 37. My parents um, bought a house in a neighborhood where we weren't wanted. And would you believe on the 19th day of June in 1939, the paper says there were about 500 of them and that the police were there, but they couldn't control the mob. And my parents, well, my dad came home from work with a gun and the police told him if he busted a cap, they'd let the mob have us. Mm. So my parents sent us to friends several blocks away. They left on a cover of darkness, but the people told the place apart. They burned mm. furniture. They really, well, made a mess of it. Mind you, our parents never, ever discussed it with us. And they worked and worked and worked and bought another home. Yeah. Yeah. And so you moved from that house, you had somewhere else. Well, parents worked and. and yeah. Mm, what happened was um, it was during the Depression, and mm, my father didn't have a job. He moved to Fort Worth. He was going to send for his family. My mom sold all the possessions we had to get train fare for us to go to Fort Worth. And after we got here, um, we spent six weeks with the family from Marshall. Mm -hmm. And then we found our own place, room with the use of the kitchen. Uh, and it was, if we were here in 37, it was 39 when my parents bought a house. And of course, I've told you what happened there. Right, okay. right. It's kind of this idea you talked about, you've alluded to it, this committee of one. You became a committee of one. <laughs> it's how I see things. There were a million 500,000 people who signed a petition to make Juneteenth a holiday. I, and we I was one of them. Oh, I, I right. supported you, of course, oh, of course, right. yes. Then we were prepared to have that many more. Mm -hmm. And I contend if three million people are on the same page, mm -hmm. we can turn this country around. And so I say each one of us should be responsible for changing the mind of somebody you know who's not on the same page you are. Not gonna take a day, a week or something, but it's our responsibility to see that everybody, and I'm gonna say in lockstep so that we can get things done. It's, it's mind boggling that we have joblessness and homelessness and some people can get health care and some can't and climate change and all these things when we are the richest country in the world. Mm -hmm. We need to be about the business of changing that. Right. The fact that we've got Juneteenth the national holiday, fine, but we've got these other things that need to be More addressed. work still to be done. Yes. Talking about Juneteenth, when did it really become, what was that, that turning point for you where you said, this is what I, this is my life's passion to make oh, sure this passes? Oh, shuck, it didn't happen like that. <laughs> Now, we had Juneteenth in Fort Worth. Mm -hmm. I remember one, the paper says there were 10,000 people, three days, 10,000, 10,000, 10,000, 30,000 people in a tiny little park called Sycamore Park. Mm. Oh, did we have fun. <laughs> the Historical Society, we took exhibits out for people, you know, 
educationals. Nobody was interested. But we didn't stop there. And then I met Dr. Ronald Myers. He was a medical doctor. He was a Baptist minister and a jazz musician all rolled into one. <laughs> and he was responsible for at least 43 of the 50 states having Juneteenth celebrations or observances. Oh, I hope he's looking down and thinking, well, they did get something done. Right. <laughs> but uh, I don't know, after Dr. Myers and his impression on me that freedom is for everyone, mm. just not black people or brown people or white people. Freedom is for everyone, and we must get the story out, get it told, get people to understand that we'd have to work together to right. make this a reality. And I heard someone recently say you know, that freedom, you have to work at it every single day. You it's do. not its not something that's just given to you, but no. every single day you have to work at it. You earn it, mm -hmm. you earn it. I, I, I look at the what Dr. King did, and, that advanced us a bit, and Malcolm X, and Rosa Parks, and way back with Sojourner Truth and others. Just, and again, we need a push that's gonna put us over the top where everybody understands that freedom is for everyone. Mm -hmm. I even advocate that we celebrate from the 19th of June to the 4th of July. <laughs> I'd be okay with that. Oh, wow. I'd be okay with that. You know, well, I, I think you know, or you may, that part of my district includes Como. Okay. Historically black mm -hmm. uh, area. And I've gotten, I've done a lot of work in there and gotten to know the people and uh -huh. heard their stories. And you bring up the, the times, which, you know, I didn't grow up under segregation, oh, okay. right? I, but I've, I've heard the stories. And, mm -hmm. and that's why I think it's also important for us to keep telling those stories so people understand. The people need to hear them, understand them, and heal from mm -hmm. it. Right. Let's get on from that. Right. We've got so much to do that we don't have time right. to revel in it. Well, good points. And um, you've gotten a lot of attention, a lot of honors. I think you're a doctorate from TCU now. Is that correct? Uh, and three, three doctorates. Three what doctorates. Am I, what am I to do with <laughs> three doctorates? Real doctor, doctor, doctor. Oh, no, well, no, 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 no. And as you just said, for someone that didn't go to college straight away and went oh. to college a little bit later, and now you've got... Three doctorates. I think you've met several presidents <laughs> along the way. Is that right? Yeah, I have. I have. I really have. Oh, gee. I'm and then, a, then a big, the big thing that's the Nobel <laughs> Peace Prize. Can I tell you this? Yeah, of course you can. I've spent the money. There's money that comes with the prize, and I've got a laundry list of <laughs> mile long of all the things that have to need to be done. And one of them is that there's a lady in Uganda. Mm -hmm. She's the mother of 44 children by the same husband. Wow. 30 of them, 38 of them still living. Wow. I want her to have container houses to house all those people. Now, the lady hadn't asked me for a dime. But that's one of my dreams, to go to Uganda and see and I'm sure they've got containers in Uganda, but here in Texas, we take containers, and boy, you'd think they were palaces when they get through with them. <laughs> I want her to have several of those. We yeah, could do so. that. There's some oh. hotel or boutique hotels that are now yeah. suited with these containers. Yes, and they're yes. in an office building just down the street made sure. out of containers. Uh, so I've got a list, and I've decided, now, nah, Opal, you might not win that. But I've got all these friends in Texas and elsewhere with money. I expect them to see that that laundry list is fulfilled. I do. Well, you have a very big heart, <laughs> um, and you've inspired a lot of people along the way. And, you know, what, what do you want the kids today to know? I want them to know that it's their responsibility, that there's no free lunch, that we have to work at making this a great country. Yeah and they are not hobbled with what happened in the past. They can work at making this a wonderful country, 
and the fact that we all bleed red blood and we're all alike and that their friends in school, they are learning because, right. oh, I'm so glad the kids have a better opportunity to learn about the person that they're in the classroom with. Yeah. They're gonna turn this country around. That's wonderful. I just hope I live to see it. <laughs> <laughs> and it's talking about your book here that you've written, so children understand <laughs> well, the history. They do, they do, they do, but they need to know their history. That's right. You know? Right. And um, I, I, I wrote the little book for them. It's not hard to read, and I hope parents will get it and read it to their children. And no. Juneteenth, June plus 19, equals Juneteenth. Uh, and, and this one, there's a special edition out, and it has the pictures of the presidents signing the bill. Oh, you know? So it's out in March. Um, I'm looking forward. <laughs> Great. Well, thanks for taking the time. Thanks for having the passion that you've had, and thanks for um, just just being you and letting us be a part of your journey. Oh, listen, I like young people, and you're all <laughs> young people if you're not 95. <laughs> Remember that. <laughs> it's true. Well, thanks for being with us today. All right. Thank, thank you, you for having Appreciate me. Appreciate you. Uh -huh. Oh! Well, thank you for joining us today for this episode of Fort Worth Forward. We hope you've enjoyed it as much as we have and learned a little bit more about what's happening here in Fort Worth. See you next time.